Okay, we're in the book of Revelation, and uh, today will be broadcast number 14. And uh, before we get into Revelation chapter 10, just want to do a quick recap, if I may, to look at what we've looked at over the last several weeks. And from Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it speaks about how things which must shortly come to pass. And those things, of course, will be the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, and eternity. Also from Revelation 1, verse 3, it says how the time is at hand. And that term comes to mind, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Time, of course, is uh, very much the context, very much to get things up and running, to uh, accept that time is very precious here, today and gone tomorrow. Revelation 1, verse 5 makes it very clear that the Lord's love to mankind is only through his son's divine blood. And if you get a chance, look at Acts 20, 28. From Revelation 1, 18, Jesus alone has the keys of hell and of death. And that's also reaffirmed from chapter 3, verse 7, which makes it clear to me that salvation is in a person, not a place. Also from chapter 3, verse 22, the last word would be churches. And that makes the case very clear to me anyway that Revelation 2 and 3 is addressed to the churches. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven thunders. And I'll come back to that description as we go through today's study. But the point I want to make is this, that from chapters 4 right up until chapter 19, the church isn't found once. And that's something that is to be repeated time after time to prove that the rapture has been and gone. From chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, the martyred saints are now in heaven, not purgatory. Also from chapter 6, verse 10, holy and true, in reference to the Lord, cross-reference back to chapter 3, verse 7, uh, speaking about how the Lord is holy and true, and these two expressions are very much in reference to his deity. Holy and true, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, also referred to in the book of Hebrews as being the holy apostle of the Lord. Revelation chapter 8 will be a reenactment to the multiple plagues that afflicted the people in Egypt back in the days of Moses. It's very important that we don't forget that. But this time it's slightly different. Back in Exodus chapter 9, it would be the people of Egypt, Pharaoh's people, that would suffer the most. And yet, during the tribulation, it's going to be very much in reference to Israel's suffering, Jacob's troubles, uh, Daniel's 70th week, the great tribulation. And out of 7 million Jews, as of present in Israel, only 144,000 will be chosen for service, not salvation. Very uh, reminiscent of the Lord choosing 12 apostles to be his apostles out of many in Israel. In fact, you've got the 70 and the 12. So out of 82 people, the Lord decided to choose just 12 people, just 12 men to go on to be his apostles. Also from chapter 5 verse 6, speaks about the seven spirits of the Lord and that term comes to my mind, how you are my ears and my eyes. My eyes and my ears, very much demonstrating that we are the Lord's people and we, as we go out and about into our towns and communities to preach the gospel, are very much representing our great King and Saviour. From chapter 9, verses 3 to 6, mankind is no longer master of the earth. You've got scorpions, 
you've got locusts and serpents very much on the rise, being mobilized to attack mankind, those that are not saved, those that were never raptured, those that will go through the tribulation. And as they say, the shoe is very much on the other foot. From Revelation chapter 9, verse 8, you've got an almost effeminate description of such demonic creatures that come up out of the pit. From chapter 9, verse 11, we read about Abaddon, Apollyon, and the JWs believe that Apollyon, Abaddon, is actually Jesus Christ, would you believe? But from chapter 9, scorpions, locusts, serpents, very much picture the unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And from chapter 6, you've got the four horsemen, I mentioned this last week, that are very much sent to punish those on the earth, and yet by chapter 9, verse 18, only three horsemen are now mentioned. And I made the case some weeks ago that one of the four horsemen has been eliminated, has been put to death. Also from Revelation, I think it's Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, it speaks about there being silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I thought to myself, uh, what it's like to go into a doctor's waiting room and wait for your results to an operation or a blood test or to go to a job interview and wait and wait and wait to be called. And I've had many of those over the years and it's a nerve wracking experience. And yet you've got 30 minutes in heaven as the seventh seal has been opened by the Lamb, going back to Revelation chapter 5. Also, it's worth mentioning again the parenthesis found throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 to 22 is not necessarily in chronological order, and I will try and explain that as we go through the next uh, few weeks and conclude the book of Revelation. But what I want to do before we get into chapter 10 is just go back to Isaiah chapter 11. And I had some email sent to me over the past few days to further explain my understanding of Revelation chapter 1, speaking about these seven spirits before the throne of the Lord, which is cross-referenced back to Isaiah 11, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And, and every reference Bible that I've ever looked at says that Isaiah 11, 1, 2, 3, and 4 is a description to Revelation chapter 1. So please turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11, and let's see if I can further clarify my position from chapter 1 some weeks ago. And it shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, Holy Ghost, comma, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, comma, the Spirit of counsel and might, comma, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, if you add these up, it is true that it comes to seven, okay, they, or they come to seven. But what you can't get from this piece of scripture are seven holy spirits. And that's my initial statement some weeks ago. You see, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are attributes. They are characteristics of the Messiah, not literal spirits per se. So at best, you've got a sevenfold anointing from the Holy Ghost on the Messiah. So one more time from 11.2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, like David, priest, prophet, and king, comma, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's a gift, by the way. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Let's keep reading on verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the spirits of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So I hope that has helped somewhat when it comes to those of us which are Bible students, Bible Bereans. And I think when you read these verses, although you may have seven parts to the Holy Ghost from verse 2, you don't get seven spirits per se. And also spirit in Revelation 1 is uppercase, denoting perhaps the Holy Spirit. Although I will repeat myself again before we get into today's broadcast and say that the spirits from Revelation chapter 1 are also found from, let's see now, chapter 5. In fact, I'm not quite through with the seven spirits of the Lord. I think it's worth just spending some more time really 
drilling in to such verses. In fact, go back to Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, being Europe, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, capital S. But again, there's only one Holy Ghost. There's only one God the Father. There's only one God the Son. So at best, Isaiah 11, 2, and the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Ghost, shall rest upon him. And then the breakdown follows one final time. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So at best, you've got a sevenfold blessing, a sevenfold anointing on the Messiah. No more than that. But from Revelation chapter 1, this breakdown to the seven spirits which are before his throne are also found from Revelation chapter 5, I think it is. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Seven spirits, seven eyes, seven horns, demonstrating the church on the one hand. You are my eyes and my ears. Okay, you see what I want you to see. You relay back to me what I want you to relay back to me. And that's why I made the case that when you witness for the Lord and speak to unsaved people, they see the Lord in you. We are, one more time, his eyes and his ears. Also from chapter 6, verse 12. Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power, one, and riches, two, and wisdom, three, and strength, four, and honor, five, and glory, six, and blessing, seven. Demonstrating one more time, seven attributes, seven characteristics of the Messiah. Not seven spirits per se. I don't want this to sound repetitive, but it's important that I make this point. And one final time, and we will get into today's study from chapter 7, showing us the sevenfold blessing, the sevenfold anointing to the Messiah. Chapter 7, verse 12. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Blessing one, glory two, wisdom three, thanksgiving four, honor five, power six, might seven. So I think you hopefully are now on the same page as I am. And if you were somewhat confused about my original interpretation from chapter one, may that now be a thing of the past. So for today's broadcast, if we may, we finally got there. Let's start in Revelation chapter 10, please. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, seven thunders, seven continents. There's even a movie that was made some years ago, called Seven Thunders. There are seven entrances into your face. You've got two eyes, you've got two ears, two nostrils and a mouth. Seven, once again, is a very important number found throughout the Word of God. But here, this mighty angel has come down from heaven, and most commentators believe it is in reference to the Messiah. Now, there is a term back in the Old Testament where the Lord is called the Mighty God, El Gabor in Hebrew. And yet one reference Bible that I was looking at last night suggested that this isn't the Messiah. And that was argued based on the Greek word, alos and hetros. There are two Greek words for another, alos and hetros. One means another of the same kind, and one means another of a different kind. And um, one of my reference Bibles made the case that this angel that has appeared, chapter 10, verse 1, is of the same angelic creature, or is of the same angelic host, found in chapters 8 and 9. Let's keep reading on. This angel had in his hand a little book open, verse 2, 
and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, pretty much denoting Lord of heaven and of the earth. In fact, you're also told from the previous chapter how the heaven, I think it was from, uh, yeah, it was from chapter 6, verse 14, departs as a scroll when it is rolled together. That's the first heaven, not the second heaven or the third heaven. But here, this angel has come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. Don't spiritualize it, take it literally. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Could be the Bible, could be the book of Revelation, or more likely the title deeds of the earth. And he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. Very reminiscent of Zachariah's accounts of the Messiah coming back to split the Mount of Olives. I think it is from memory. So it is possible that this mighty angel is the Messiah. And yet again, if you go back to Alos and Hetros, two different Greek words, one denoting the same of a kind and the other denoting a difference of the same kind. So one is of the same class and another is of another class. But as far as I can see, this could quite possibly be the Messiah. Verse 3 again, And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. Christ, of course, is the tribe of Judah, referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Sit up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And yet the JWs come along, Ted Armstrong came along, the SDA came along, false religions come along and try to offer you a description, an explanation as to what these seven thunders are all about. And yet you were told that John was to not utter them. Don't write what you've seen or heard. So it is a mystery. And I think it will be further revealed to those in the tribulation. So speculation is pointless. Verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. This mystery of God is probably in reference to why the Lord allowed the devil to fall and cause the fall of Adam and Eve, and why he continues to allow the devil to go about like a roaring lion, seeking to devour whom he will. But this angel, again verse 5, is standing upon the sea and upon the earth, very much picturing deity, lifts up his hand to heaven, I would assume it's his right hand, going back to uh, chapter 1, 16, how the Lord has the seven spirits in his right hand, being seven angels, and in his mouth a two-edged sword, being the word of God. We call that divine inspiration for the scripture, and also eternal security for the church, because those angels, those spirits, are assigned to the seven churches. Swears by him that liveth forever and ever, deity of course, who created heaven, out goes evolution, and the things that therein are, without exception, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the appointed time. But here, that time should be no longer. The 24-hour clock, as we know, will be consigned to history. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets, Old Testament prophets. And again, this incredible book that we call the book of Revelation is very Jewish. John was a Jew, writing to seven churches in Europe, mainly Gentile churches, and yet the Jewish aspect is very difficult to overlook. 
the mystery of God, something which was hidden, but will be revealed, should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So one final time from verse 7, when the Lord blows the final whistle, when time comes to an end, he will reveal why things went the way that they went, why Satan was created and allowed to fall, and why Adam and Eve were created and allowed to fall. And we get into free will and the Lord's sovereignty, and our Calvinist friends go berserk. The two can run side by side, incidentally. Let's keep reading on, please. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. I guess John must have been, on the one hand, quite excited to do this, and on the other hand, quite nervous, quite apprehensive. And this voice is either from Daniel or the Lord Jesus. 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. We call that bitter sweet. This scripture is bitter sweet. It's sweet to those of us which are saved, which read it, believe it, and preach it, but it's also bitter to those of us which have to talk to people about the eternal things of the Lord and warn people about the judgments of the Lord. It is bittersweet because most people that I know are not saved and don't want to be saved and are quite happy not being saved. And therefore it is bittersweet to me. But here he's told to take the little book and eat it up. Now, of course, this isn't literal. This is figurative language. The word of God is referred to as being milk, honey, and even meat. In fact, the Apostle Peter speaks about tasting of the Lord to see that he's good. The writer of Hebrews also uses the same type of language to explain that this book is alive. And when we read the word of God, when we famish from the word of God, not literally, of course, but spiritually, it's like enjoying a meal. So one more time. Give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up. Read it, meditate upon it. Bear it in your heart that you won't sin against the Lord. And it shall make thy belly bitter. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. You can't miss it, can you? Bitter sweet. 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. Well, of course, you got seven plagues. Never mind the plagues of London back in the 17th century, which wiped out many, or Stalingrad, or uh, parts of Europe, which were almost desecrated at the end of World War II. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. There's a good picture of obedience. Not just being a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Thou must prophesy again, preach again, proclaim the truth again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. A very difficult verse to exegete. John was an old man when he wrote the book of Revelation. So the thought of him somehow being sent back to earth to preach before peoples, nations, tongues and kings seems like a tall order. And yet that's what the text would seem to suggest. So 11 verses from Revelation chapter 10. And I hope you were able to follow along with me as I gave a very important recap as to where we are thus far in this somewhat difficult book to read and teach and correctly interpret. And I guess if I were to sum up these 11 verses, very brief but very important, I would say that you've got this mighty angel, could be the Messiah or not, coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, which is similar to the Son of Man, Matthew 24, come back to the earth, very much riding a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, like the Noahic covenant uh, back in the Old Testament, the Lord promising that he would never drown 
the earth again, but he will certainly burn it up with fire at the second advent. And his face was, as it were, the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Take it literally, don't spiritualize it. And this mighty angel could be El Gabor, a term for the Messiah from uh, the Old Testament, or as I say, it could be another angel from a different class, has in his hand, probably the right hand, a little book open. And he sets his foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Again, demonstrating that this angel has authority to do what he is about to do. And he cries with a loud voice, which is also what saved people back in the New Testament would do, that were filled with the Holy Spirit. And here he roars like a lion, very much a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess if I were to commit myself, I would say that this angel is probably a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to go beyond that and be dogmatic and say that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, for me, is somewhat problematic. Not just based on the two Greek words, alos and hetros, but I think based on the fact that John doesn't say like unto the Son of Man, which he could have done. He just says, a mighty angel. And he cries, he preaches, he raises his voice, and seven thunders utter their voices. Now, like I say, seven continents, so you could have a worldwide thunderstorm, perhaps, during this angel's trip to the earth, but to go beyond that is problematic, not to mention pointless, because we just don't know. John was told not to utter those things which he had seen, just to write down what he had heard. And that picture is living by faith, not sight. Five, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. Picture there, perhaps, of Christ being in submission to his Father. And the cults come along and say, but if Christ is God, why would he say that my Father is greater than I? Or no man knows the hour but my Father only. There you are, you see. Christ isn't God. No, Christ had two natures, son of man, son of God. You were told over in Philippians 2 that he emptied himself, that he took upon him the form of a servant. He was in submission to his father. And the cults overlook that, as do the Muslims, and as a result, go to hell, because they completely bypass his glorious deity. Six, swears by him that liveth forever and ever, the triune God, who created heaven, three heavens of course, but here it's in the singular, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. You're told also in the book of Daniel that of the increase of his government there shall be no end. Starts in the millennium and goes into eternity and way beyond. And yet here time has been dismissed. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to the servants the prophets. Seventh angel, seventh vial, seventh attack, if you will, seventh trumpet, seven sevens, the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth, which, if I were to spiritualize, would suggest that this is an open book, being the Holy Bible, but it's only going to be relevant and understandable and precious to those of us which are saved. Nine, ten, it will result in you becoming bittersweet because of the content of this book. And verse 11, and I will close. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. A great picture for those of us which have teaching ministries to keep on preaching. Preach and preach and preach until you preach. So I think I will leave it there. And next week we will look at the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Thank you.